and we have, are being joined by Rob Palmer. Look at that. It's the well-known skeptic. Hello, Susan. Hey, Rob, I know you from somewhere. Where do I know you from? Maybe from FAT. Oh, man, that was such a wonderful talk. Can you put a link um, on the, well, no, I've got it right here. So Rob did a talk with John Delancey from uh, Q and some other stuff, Star Trek, things you might have seen. And it do was we want, not do, do we want to talk about what started that off, which was you declining to interview him for Skeptical Inquiry? You said, who is this John Delancey guy? Uh, no, I know who in? John Delancey is. That's not Does true. anybody want to interview him for Skeptical Inquiry? I said Inquiry? somebody wanted, well, my mission, for those of you out there who are watching this, who do not understand, my mission isn't to to improve Wikipedia. My mission is not to get all the psychics off of off of social media or wherever. It is not to end a facilitated communication. Those are all byproducts. The, my main goal is to grow our community and the people that are want to do more. It is the people. So if I threw an interview out to you or whoever, it's because somebody else should have the limelight for a while, and you took it. So that was great. Yeah. So I got to. Uh to try not to fanboy all over him when I did the interview for Skeptical Inquirer and not talk Star Trek, but to talk about why he was going to be talking at SciCon. And uh, yeah, so that was that was fascinating. So that's where I first got to meet the guy. And because that got published in Skeptical Inquirer and in fact is my local skeptic group where I've, I've, I've spoken and we keep in touch, they said, hey, uh, did you keep the contact information for John Delancey? You think he'd like to come to Philadelphia? Well, that was a, that was a coup or? for them, for sure. Yeah, it, it, and, and, I, and uh, I've been in contact with him since yesterday, and it's it's either a match or the highest number they've ever had of anyone on. Oh, my uh, gosh, it was thing. something else. Who do you think might have been the next highest? Of, um, Maybe Randy. I, I don't know. but And they, they may have been talking about in person then, because... Uh, you know, I think a lot of people would have come in person to see them. This is way, way pre-pandemic uh, mm -hmm. when he came to speak there live. That might be the case. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so so they, they've had, you know, numbers in the 30s and 40s, and we had a uh, hundred something people. Uh, and, you know, and now they just published the link for the YouTube. Uh, 110 views already. Yeah. And so that's going to go up quite a bit from there. And uh, once it, once it gets uh, published around, so that was very, that was very cool. And I, and I hope to get more people to join the organization because, you know, that was the primary reason to have him to, uh, to get mm -hmm. interest in fact. It was great. It was great. And I can't say to people, I was telling them, um, we had a board and a board meeting, but a planning meeting yesterday with Eugenie Scott and uh, Jay Diamond and, and uh, some different people who are planning the, uh, Leonard Trammell and, and planning the, the Skeptical that's happening this upcoming weekend. And um, um, I mentioned it and I said, I can't say anything to you guys because I don't want to give anything away. But it was really great. And, and people, you could tell people really enjoyed it because of the, the audience participation were saying things. And you had a school group there. How did that happen? Well, so to... Uh, to use the room that they use at the Philadelphia Community College when it's live, uh, you need somebody who's connected with the university in order to uh, be your sponsor. And, and that professor who wrote them, if you saw that, was their sponsor. So he's the one who allows them to use the room when, when they're live. And he's a physics uh, professor, and many of his students came on because John Delancey was there. So That, that was, was really, exciting to see some really students cool. there. So what, what did you think of when he sent me to the continuum for asking him the Star Trek questions? <laughs> You're not supposed to say anything. <laughs> no, it was surprises. It. it was fun. That was a lot of fun. And I was really laughed. glad he was into that. I came up with the idea you uh -huh. know, the week before. And I, I made a little Zoom video just myself. to said, hey, is this crazy? Is this too stupid? What do you think about this, John? He said, oh, that's great. We'll do that. He's got a really good sense. I of was him. wondering how that happened. I figured it was your idea, but that was really funny and took us off. So don't say anything more. I want people to watch the yeah, video. Yeah. So yeah, so the kind of the joke was, you know, everywhere he goes, no matter what he wants to speak about, seriously, the first question when they open the questions, tell me about your role in Star Trek. You know, that's it. It's tell either me about that you or, or Star Trek. Right, or My Little Pony. So, so we're, we're going to try to cut that down. If anyone from the audience wanted to ask him, we left 15 minutes at the end for questions to come up in that regard. Uh, I actually don't remember. I'll have to watch the video now if, if that did happen. But, you know, I, I got in one question. Just, 
because it was I, fun it was a to. lot of fun and it, it was a very serious talk too it wasn't a, a fanboy kind of talk no i tried not I to expected. do that it was a it was a serious talk about you know when you mentioned of course we're all thinking of q and q and on of course we're thinking of that because of his you know his title but it was he had a really obviously he's been asked that question before because he had a great answer about q and q and on yeah. and um the way he the way he dealt with the conversation like somebody asked him how do you stay positive what was the what was the question they asked him i think that it was yeah, yeah basically him. with the world falling apart regarding you know belief in science how does he stay positive yeah well you yeah. watch uh you watch uh, william shatner go to space and you <laughs> realize that, that science is still kicking his ass you know we still we still have a lot of and somebody yeah, asked him yeah, right wait as to the to the moon you know somebody asked him if he'd want to go to space i think didn't they yes and i thought that was fascinating that he wouldn't <laughs> yeah. go because yeah. i'd rather stay and and have my my death happen on the ocean and <laughs> blow up on yeah him. which by the way he didn't get a chance to talk about it. he like nearly did die that way he was uh, there was there was a and i don't remember if i did use this in my written interview for skeptical inquire or it was like something that didn't make the final cut but he told me the story where he was in a horrible storm that he could have absolutely the, the boat could have been swamped in the middle of the ocean and it was in the context of well you're you're an atheist wouldn't you just pray to god and he goes no i was just trying to figure out how to save myself how to make the boat not sink and he was by himself at that time right i, I think so this time i asked him and he said no he sailed with three people so i'm not sure what the deal at the time was he almost died i thought so yeah so, but that that's 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 a frightening situation. I'd but rather again, go to I'd rather be lost in space than to put myself in a boat like that. That's scary as heck. I've read yeah, two stories. I, I can't imagine either situation. I actually got almost deathly ill at Mission, I think it was called Mission Space at Epcot Center, which is just a giant centrifuge. And I, I, it, I came off, I was nauseous as hell. It ruined my entire day. I I, I cannot imagine actually you know engaging in a real rocket flight unfortunately i guess you my go in with an empty stomach or something my sister actually applied to be an astronaut is that right so i wrote a wikipedia page for uh the person at my company who did fly into space bob senker yeah i'm gonna, and, I'm gonna we, we should turn it back to wikipedia let's yeah so i'm, I'm, let's, I'm, let's I'm trying to I'm trying to do a little bit so yeah so when i became a wikipedia editor one of the things i realized i had seen his wikipedia page is somebody who flew on the space shuttle and it was a stub and in fact there were some comments on the talk page uh every wikipedia page has associated with a talk page where editors discuss what should or should not be on the page and basically somebody said this is a resume why is there a resume on, on wikipedia and it's like this is a person who flew in space at the time there were probably less than 250 humans who flew in space i think he deserves a wikipedia page but to make sure it stayed i saved it and i made a nice page for him um but my sister worked in the company too and she also applied to the program so i did i did not but you know, Bob got selected along with a, with a backup uh, to to train, and uh, then at, at the end, Bob was selected to fly, and he went on the last mission before a shuttle disaster. He was on the mission right before Challenger blew up, so it, it became a pivotal mission because he was a mission specialist or payload specialist, C -K which at the time they were allowing companies uh -huh. to. That's why he went because we both worked at RCA Astrospace and we were paying NASA to launch our satellite instead of paying the French Ariane program. And it was more money to launch it on the shuttle. So in order to, as an incentive, they would let one of your employees go too. So that's oh, how, is that how Bob, he did it. That's how Bob Sanker got the fly. That's correct. Oh, yeah. I'm trying to pull it up and I but, can't. But when the, when the next shuttle exploded, including killing the supposed, well, it would have been the first teacher in space. She didn't make it. Krista McAuliffe, you know, NASA changed its point of view about how safe this was. And they didn't have another like private citizen try to fly for ages after that. I think it was a decade. Was it that long? Here, Something here's like the page. Yeah. Look at this beautiful page. There he is. And you can see these nice photos. Now photographs have to be uploaded by the person who owns them. So if it's an organization or if it's a human being or whatever it is. So we can't just take pictures off the internet. Yeah. yeah in fact it was an interesting story i had two more pictures in the gallery down there mm -hmm. that i got from my own collection they were documents from rca that they gave out to employees about bob senker our employee being in space 
And someone eventually came and took them off saying, no, you don't have the copyright to this. This is original publication by RCA. You need to get RCA's approval for this. It's like, a uh, company went out of business 30 years ago. It's like, it's like <laughs> little, little too much work there. So Bob, yeah. let's, uh, Bob, Rob, let's, I'm looking at the word Robert here. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what you've been doing. Now, look at this. We, we've hit 100, pay, 100 million page views, but you personally, as of last night when this loaded, 9,804,585 page views. That is astounding. Yeah, and as I often point out to people when these numbers come up, like this is a small part of the work that the team actually does, right? These are just the pages we write fully or like they're stubs and we improve them greatly. And those are the ones that attract here in the 100 million and in my almost 10 million. But like most of my edits are, are outside of that. Right? Like they're, they're important, but they're, we don't track them because we can't. We improve general content. We take out some nonsense. We'll improve the lead of the <laughs> article. Oh my cat scratched me, sorry. Oh. oh she tried to climb up and she was climbed up and grabbed no. it. No, this is Ariadne. That's Ariadne. She grabbed onto me. Or Adrian she as pulled it herself up. up. Yeah, Adrian. She pulled herself up and that scared me because I didn't know she was right there. Hey, you just gotta get the show on you, huh? Cats. Cats always control the world. And now that we're home more, they really do rule us. Uh, yeah, I've, I've done a few. I've done a wow. few projects where the cat comes in and meows really loudly in the background. I hit it on mute really quick. <laughs> well, that's what the interview I just Mark and I did with uh, Ono Ross and Carrie. The cat took over. I heard it. She was meow meow. So number one page on Stat Badger right now. Absolute number one page that is getting views has already over two million five hundred thousand page views. But the number one in the last seven days is Havana Syndrome, and you wrote it. Well, yeah, so that one. What's going on with that? Yeah, it, it, stuff. it is tough. So, the, of course, as you know, I'll say this for the people listening, the, the rule on Wikipedia is what gets reported on a Wikipedia page is what is the consensus, right? So if it's science, the scientific consensus, the medical consensus. Unfortunately, the Havana syndrome, which is, is the name uh, for the um, supposed medical um, symptoms that, that happen when uh, people are attacked by science fiction-y weapons that have not been identified. You know, it started in Cuba, went to China, it's in other countries, now they're saying it happens in the United States. So most of the press is following what the U.S. government agencies have said is that this is real. You know, there's brain injuries and whatever. And there's a minority of people who are experts like Robert Bartholomew in mass psychogenic illness that say this has all the red flags of that. And there are no real attacks going on here. Mm -hmm. And they keep publishing about it, but it's just a few people doing it. So unfortunately it's hard to keep that information on the page. And I don't even think it's in the lead now because it keeps getting taken out. So, you know, I do my best. If you were to look at the talk page of this, it's, it's horrendous regarding skeptics are should should stay in their own lane about ufos and bigfoot what do they know about you know uh this because this is actually attacks going on in diplomats and they're not realizing that this is probably just humans making mistakes and what they think is the reason right and 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 when, yeah. unfortunately you know the the u.s government agencies have come out and said oh it's real we don't know what's causing it but there's really brain injuries and now there's like medical payments being made to diplomats so of course you know, it's I, real then yeah. we're getting paid it's, right. it's, it's exactly. distressing now squaring the strange just did an episode about it i haven't listened to it it's on my feed to listen to next uh um, so that might help maybe we can use that if it's new material but yeah anyway the interview so yeah, robert bartholomew yeah it'll say it's the same it's the same person unfortunately we need more people talking about this who are experts in the field because i've gotten that a lot there's one other guy robert bartholomew and whoever that, you know, that's all there are only two people it's only their their fringe and, and that's a problem. Yeah. So October 15th, this just came out. I'm really interested in listening oh, okay. to Definitely. their story on it. Listen Looking at that. the Facebook page, um, they were talking, you know, they put up that they had done this interview and people were commenting saying how much they enjoyed the show and how much they understood what was going on after they have now. Uh, yeah, that, and th and this is one of these ones where I've talked to people like, okay, I worked in the defense department. I work with people who work on weapons that are technically secret. Like, radar weapons and they were talking about it was microwave energy and like, there's no way that this would cause anything we have nothing like that that's not possible 
but yet, you know, anyone I talk to outside, I'll say, of course it's true. I read it in the newspapers every day. And, and you know what is interesting so, is that now it's, let's see if this, if, if you know the answer, because I don't know, but they have diplomats working in, let's say the Cuba place. There's also Cubans working in there, right? Right, right, right. So they, the people who are reporting the symptoms are the diplomats, not the regular people who are working there. So yeah, how, did, how did this mass? No, uh, it's amazing. And it's tar- like in, in the targeted course, just the diplomats with their part of the, microwave, part of the red flags, but not right. the other people who work right. there. Right. And it's no matter where they are, like someone was hit in the park walking her dog because she's a diplomat or someone else was went home to a supermarket. And she said, this is ridiculous. Is that really what they're saying? Yeah, it, it, you can read so many of these accounts. It is just so ridiculous. But it's it's being taken at become, face value. We have become a very scary world where where anecdotes are evidence and anecdotes, yeah. yeah, and experts. Who cares? And yeah. I, I was watching the news. Well, well, but part of the problem here, Susan, is the experts are the medical people, and they don't know anything about skepticism, right? They don't understand well, that these is issues. And, that is and 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 in fact, you know, the feedback on the talk pages: these these skeptics aren't medical people. They don't know what they're talking about. The medical people know what they're talking about. And, and that is, that's one hundred percent true. I you see these uh, news agencies and stuff like that that come out like with the UFO videos, yep. as if another a good example. It's like here here's Dick West going, uh, yeah, we uh, analyzed that about three years ago, right? And, right. and, and they lead they lead with time. the video with the triangular pyramid. Like, oh, it's all this Ooh, new stuff. A, it's I, like, I, but I, I, look, I that's know. clearly an aperture problem. I already showed that in my video, but they just ignore that. It, 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 it's, it's I watch a lot of news. It, it, it's interesting to watch the news, and it's as if they have not ever heard of scientific skepticism or our community, and that this is this exists here yeah. to to make sure that we're getting good information out there. And they're like, "Oh, what's this homeopathy stuff?" You know, you're like, "Where have you been?" Yeah, the the UFO thing is a really good example of that because it was on. ABC and CNN and, and all the big news networks were, were like just interviewing those same people who've been at this for the since the 70s, mm-hmm. who are still the same people who are involved now getting paid huge sums of money by the U.S. government. And they're going to get more money to continue because the report that came out was like a little bit iffy, right? Oh, it could be foreign technology. And then so you use Occam's razor, right? Did China or Russia jump ahead two generations in technology without any of you know, none of the science was available anywhere that we could know about, uh, or it's extraterrestrials visiting, visiting us, or it's people making mistakes. But no, it can't be that. It's got to be the other things. And so they're going to pump more money into, you know, getting more data on this nonsense. It's, it is totally ridiculous. And the media just flames it because they just keep promoting it because that's what sells, right? No one cares if a skeptic comes on and goes, mm, no, probably not. Uh, we're not at that place yet in our society. I hope I live to hear that see, hear that time, but it, we're not there yet. Yeah. Let's look at let's look at some of the other pages you've done. Okay, let's see. Frontline doctors, America's frontline doctors. Yeah, so so it's that was two hundred eighty six thousand views. That was a paragraph on Simone Gold's page, I think, and I thought, well, this deserves its own. So I wrote the the whole page. So we were like, yeah. oh, no, I don't know. Will it become a thing? <laughs> yeah right we have so, to yeah. we have to weigh that and it's true you That's get a true. page you get it you're thinking will this go will will you want to get the page out before the media really yes. big on that page but yet you can't write the page until the media has a reaction to it so right, right. I, right. so yeah so so for people who don't know well. simone gold was written by kelly burke as i recall she rewrote that page into a big page yes I think that's right. Right. So Simone Gold is a, is a medical doctor and she's the founder of America's Frontline Doctors. And they gained notoriety at the beginning of the pandemic in 2020 uh, when they you know, made a presentation uh, in front of the Capitol that, oh, it's like there was one doctor who believed in evil spirits. And there were other people talking about like hydroxychloroquine. There wasn't a vaccine yet, but they later became anti-vaccine. And yeah, so people who are advocates of that whole you know, anti-science movement actually used the website of America's Frontline Doctors and sent it to family and friends. Look at this. 
this is America's frontline doctors. That sounds legitimate. And they say, don't take the vaccine, use hydroxychloroquine, use whatever the, that, that chemical that's also used for uh, horses, uh, right? They're totally on the opposite side of what actual medical science says. And yet, because people want to believe what they want to believe from confirmation bias, if they already believe it's wrong, someone sends them that, it's, oh, this is proof. So what we did collectively is I wrote one of the pages, Kelly wrote the other page, and therefore if someone goes to Google these things, they're very likely going to get the Wikipedia pages, which, you know, shows it's all nonsense. Right. And then also we springboard, springboard? From, from frontline doctors, you're able to write other pages too, because they're all like mentioned on there. It was like a one-stop shop, the frontline doctors, because there were so many other people on that page that they had to have uh, pages. Right. One of the pages that I remember that I think you wrote was the cupping thing. No, I, I didn't write cupping. Well, who wrote cupping? We've never cupping. written cupping. Oh, okay. But did we like improve it? Because I remember. We did. Okay. We okay. So it wasn't, it's not, all right. So it's one of those categories, not, we didn't improve it enough to kind of wrote count the, it. We wrote enough. the lead. In our numbers, but okay, and that's very important because that happened during the two Olympics ago. 2016. Yeah, and people started to, whoa, why are all these weird round spots on Phelps back? And what's going on here? And then the, the, the page just shot up all the way on that one, right? And there you go. We added in the lead that uh, this is pseudoscience and it doesn't really do anything. Absolutely. Except damage your skin. So David Polides, how do you say his last name? I, I, I've actually never heard it pronounced, so, except, well, Kyle, Kyle, says it. Kyle, Kyle says it, but I'm not sure, Pal I can't say Pal Kyle's Pal last name, so, Kyle Pollides, David Pollides, Pal Pallides, Pallides, I don't know, uh, 903,000 page views, yeah, so for people who don't know who he is, he, he, in, he's a rare person that invented his own conspiracy theory that took off, all right, there might be your, crazy uncle bill who created a conspiracy theory that no one listens to but this guy had some cred because he was an ex-cop uh detective i think mm -hmm. and he also made a name for himself in the bigfoot community by creating a bigfoot organization north american bigfoot something or other and then he wrote bigfoot books so then he decided that uh, there's a lot of people disappearing in national parks and it's all mysterious uh, we don't know, and I'm not going to tell you why, but it could be this and it could be that and all hints and it could be Bigfoot, could be extraterrestrial aliens taking them, it could be the government is abducting them for whatever. Uh, he's got 10 books on this subject. So yes, he's got a Wikipedia page. It was kind of bare initially. I actually added a lot to the 411. So his conspiracy for the missing people is called Missing 411. And he's got so many fans that they're constantly hitting his page, trying to take all the criticism off. And the criticism isn't from me, it comes from scientists like Dave Polish, who's a data ana analyst, who look at the data that is presented by Pallades, and you know, it's BS. Yeah, so, explain that Explain that for a second to people who are listening, who don't, yeah. who aren't part of the team. Right. We aren't putting our opinions on that. This is not, nobody cares what Rob Palmer and Susan Gerbic thinks about missing 411. What is it that we're putting on there? Yeah, so we're putting on valid criticism from reliable sources. And this is from people who either have Wikipedia articles themselves on those reliable sources, from media that has counted as a reliable source, um, and or you know experts in a field who have commented on the subject. Mm -hmm. So, uh, um, you actually had uh, Kyle on your skeptic. Is it Monterey call? County Skeptics? He right. did a video for our Monterey County Skeptics every January, you guys, for first or second Saturday of every year. And he, I'd never heard of Missing 411. And he says, I'm doing a talk on Missing 411 because I'm, I'm looking at it from a data uh, perspective. And he did the video. I took the video, put it up on a YouTube channel. It has always getting negative comments and it's always getting it's got the most views of anything by by far and the negative comments are coming from his people who have Absolutely. seen it on his website and then i told i told uh, carl please write an article for skeptical inquirer kyle, kyle you told i know i'm always that. calling him carl kyle kyle i so i asked <laughs> him to write an article for skeptical inquirer and he right. did now it's in skeptical inquirer which is a reliable source right. So then I was able to take that. So it could be used on Wikipedia. And I put it on the Wikipedia page, right. And so Kyle, who is a data scientist, he's got a podcast, The Data Skeptic. He analyzes big data 
and figures out what it, what it means, right? Mm -hmm. So he looks at the data that David Pilates presents in his books, and it's just random noise, nothing unexpected at all. But, you know, David Pilates presents it as, this is mysterious, it's definitely not right, something's going on, there's a conspiracy here. And I actually went to a local meeting in my state. <laughs> oh yeah, New Jersey. Where they talked about this. It was the topic of the night, and the person who runs it was all about it. He was like like Politi's son. He he was talking about cases that weren't even in the books yet. And he had his own Excel spreadsheet. And he was, you know, bewildered how this is being ignored by the government. This must be a cover-up. He he read something that said, Oh, look, look, these people disappeared. And he had thousands of entries. This one disappeared at Devil's Point. This one was at uh, Satan's Pond. This was at 666 something. And he says, see, see, and everyone in the group is, oh yeah. But of course he's cherry picking, right? There's thousands of entries and he's, he circled the ones that jumped out at him in that regard. So that's what happens when you're not a data analyst and you want to find you know, a trend in data. And all the people in this meeting are the kind of people, I'm not saying they are the people who did it, but they would be going on the Wikipedia page and taking the criticism off because to them, what he was speaking was gospel, right? This is true. And anyone who, I was like sitting down in my chair because I had already updated the Wikipedia page. And, you know, if they found out that I was the one who did that, that would not have gone well. <laughs> so I was the only one in that group, as far as I know, who was not, you know, uh, a regular member of that, of that group that meets every like month and um, on the other side of it. But it was interesting to see that conspiracy theory spread a little bit just organically in the room. Because I think it was the first time some of these people had heard about it. And they're talking to each other in the break. Yeah, yeah, my, my neighbor's son went off to Iraq and disappeared for three years and he must be part of this. But that's, you know, oh, and by the way, then he came back. Because, by the way, missing 411 <laughs> has people that come back. This, that includes yeah. people that have just had lost time or whatever, you know, or they were lost in the wilderness. Uh, so, all right. They're not and missing then, anymore. So how no. are they missing? But then some of this is what was scary. The people were afraid to go to their cars in the parking lot because it was night when the meeting ended. Because the way it was presented was basically a stealth sky crane could come out of the sky and grab you up to the spaceship in the middle of the night. And that's how people were disappearing. And how do we know it's not going to happen here? This is a wooded area in New Jersey. I, I, I you know, it, before QAnon and all this pandemic stuff, I would never have ever thought that there were these people were everywhere. I would have thought they were some randos here in a basement there over in somebody, you know, I. 60 people in that group. Oh, and, and during the break, one of the things apparently they do often is there's one guy who likes to go to garage sales and get, VHS tapes and DVDs of all paranormal and conspiracy stuff. And they're talking about each, yeah, I'll, I'll pay $5 for that one. I'll pay $10. That's great. I read all those books. Every single person in that room was all in on every conspiracy theory. That was amazing. Here, I'm going to show you another Wikipedia page that, that you wrote. This Wikipedia page is, uh, I don't think it was one of your first, but it's one of the nicest ones. And it has 374,000 page views Which and one? that would be this one. Oh yes since i wrote that page we have a cat that looks just like that now without the little electrode in her head in the picture oh yeah no electrode right up here in the top of her head. no let me let me blow it up so i can see it bigger hold on i clicked on something i shouldn't oh that's not much bigger it won't make it bigger come on no still not making it bigger but anyway Poor little thing. Yeah, what what is that? What is that? Uh, well, you went back to the other page. What what does the uh, citation say in, in, in the in the autograph? What does the autograph say? Thank you for your participation and my success. Eighteenth of October, nineteen sixty three. So yes, so tell that's, people who this is and what's that's the, the one and only feline launched successfully into space by the French when the United States was launching primates and the Soviet Union canines. Uh, the French launched a cat. And I had never heard of it. I actually wrote that page because my wife has uh, a subscription to, I think it's Cat Fancy. And there was some article about, oh, it's the anniversary of the flight and there's no monument to felicit that. There are monuments to Laka, the first space dog, and Ham, you know, space chimp, and there's nothing to the cat. So there was somebody 
doing a, a, a Kickstarter, I think it was, to raise money. And so I you know, greatly improved the page. I added that information about the monument being created. Very sweet. Now here, we don't only work on Wikipedia pages that have to do with pseudoscience and people of science. Anything and cats of science. That, and cats of science. Anything that falls under science, pseudoscience, people of science, we're, we're going to work on. So this is another one that you did that was a lot of fun. Um, oops. The wrong screen wants to share. Let me go back over here. Screen I want to share. I want to share this one. Here it is. I don't think this has gotten a lot of views. And it's not important to us that you have a lot of views, to be honest with you. Can you see it? Yes, photo arc. Tell us about photo arc. It's got 20, almost 23,000 views. Oh, not bad. All right. So the photo arc is a project of uh, Joel Centauri, who's a photo photographer for National Geographic magazine. And uh, it's it's got a very worthy goal of uh, taking an, a, a portrait photograph of there we go every single animal that's in uh, captivity and uh, you know realizing that many of them are endangered so as is, as is talked about in the article there is there are many books on it um, there is a document several documentaries that have been running that Nagio and uh, I, did, I found out about this because there was a tour going around the United States, maybe the world, but uh, it was maybe a two hour drive from where I live. They were going to be exhibiting some of the photos. And my wife is really into art. So we went with her and some friends. And when I came out, I Googled it. I said, there's, there's no Wikipedia article. I got to write one. And so this one I did write from scratch. And as it turns out, the people in the photo are, uh, that's my photo. So those are people, uh, well, I won't name, but those are people I know. <laughs> but the, one of the side effects of, uh, of writing these Wikipedia pages is you can sneak in a photo because, yeah. as I said with Richard earlier, the photos that we add have to be either photos we own, but they yeah. have to be oh they have to be uploaded by the owner of the photograph. So a lot of times it's uh, um, yeah. yeah yeah yeah. So you want probably, you want to talk about the most recent one? I I don't know how many views it has. I haven't, I haven't looked. Let's see what when which one is the most count. Recent? Countdown Inspirations for. Oh, yeah, let me, let me pop that up real quick. So this Countdown. was the mission of just last month where, where uh, SpaceX sent four civilians to orbit, not these simple up and down things like Shatner just got for 10 minutes of, you know, thrill. Countdown to what was it called again? It's called Countdown colon uh, Inspiration 4 with the number four with no space. Mission to space. Yeah, so... So this was Dora of course, it was across a page for the for the mission. There is a page for each of the astronauts, but there was no page for the Netflix documentary. And it's kind of a unique documentary because it's the first time there's ever been one done in real time. Like the, the there was four episodes, and the first three showed the selection and training of the crew. And then there was a long break because then the mission was going to happen, the launch, and we would see what would happen in recovery. So they timed it so that the last one was going to show all of that. And God, if there was a disaster, I don't know what they would have done. And I mentioned that in the article. But so so this, I caught this just a little bit late because, you know, the first two, I think, episodes had already been shown on Netflix. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, anytime there's something on Netflix, it's also in the news, it's going to be getting tons of hits. How come there's no page? So I wrote the page. So how many page views did it wind up getting? I released I released it I about a week look. before the by the before the launch, I think. So I, think I don't know how many people started watching the documentary at that late time. But and, and that's the thing. Netflix really does get a lot of views. Let me let me look at this one. You can talk about the other Netflix ones you've done. This is countdown. Oh yeah. So the other Netflix one I did that I recall was there was a book named Unorthodox. And it was by Deborah Feldman. It was talking about escaping her Hasidic roots. So there was um, there was a documentary for uh, there was a page for the documentary, and there was a page for the the author. Right in this case, I wrote the page for the book. It's one of the few times I've written a book one, and uh, you know it all started with the book before the whereas the documentary on Netflix there was the book, but there was no page for that. So I wrote that. You could look at how many views that it has. Uh, right. and that's so, a, so the that's countdown one has 13,000 views. That's not that's bad. That, that's as many as you get if you do, um, uh, you know, uh, did you know sometimes. So that that's good. Uh, you wrote uh, the Goop Lab. 
Also on Netflix. That's true. The Good Life. So that they did have an they did have a stub. I, I increased it greatly. There was pretty much no criticism on it. Um, yeah. So so that one is all about the horrendous show that Gwyneth Paltrow and Netflix mm -hmm. jointly created to push through the science. And uh, the Goop Lab is already with the Wikipedia page in English. Now this got translated to other languages, right? Um, from our from our team. So the English page has been viewed two hundred and seventy five thousand times. I'm not kidding you guys. This is this is huge stuff. Whenever you're writing these Wikipedia pages, um, and we train you how to do it right, you know, and and you write them, it is so powerful because how are you going to write an article about Gwyneth Paltrow that's going to get two hundred thousand page views? Right, right. No, and and, or, and it or, or, media, or people are going to read it and they're going to go, oh, I didn't right. know that about that. And you're you're unorthodox. The the book has 600,000 pages. Yeah, that's, that's, that's insane. Um, the Goop Lab, the, the, the Netflix show is got 275,000 page views. Here's yeah, and I, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, and I've worked significantly on the Goop page, but not enough to like say we did it, but yeah, we injected a lot of criticism there because originally the Goop page was just all praise for Gwyneth Paltrow and her products. And now it really very nicely documents you know, the lawsuits against the company and all, and all the harm that it's done and continues to do, unfortunately. Now, this so, one, you're not yeah. going to believe it, you people. This is also in Netflix. Now, people, I think, were really cute, confused whenever they watched this on Netflix. What the hell? I, I think they didn't really understand if they should understand that science or not, because these people were kind of like, you know, hippie, like people talk, nothing wrong with hippies. But I mean, the, the, the science they were giving was just kind of like, hey, man, it feels good or it doesn't. Oh, yeah. I, I actually that. have a personal people, anecdote. People were confused. I have a personal anecdote for this. My wife's cousin, we were at a, at a dinner with them and I told them I edit Wikipedia. And, and, they, and they were talking about, oh, yeah, I saw this page. And this was before I edited this page. One of the reasons I did it. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. One of the things that convinced me was watching this documentary and reading the, the Wikipedia article on what the health that I got to become a vegan. All right. So I'm not saying being a vegan is bad, but all the information telling you why you should become a vegan in this documentary is mostly nonsense. So that second paragraph sentence that you can see there was not there originally. There was like no criticism here. So now there's like you know, a whole section on criticism and it, it is highlighted in the lead saying that medical doctors, dietitians, investigative journalists describe this confusing causation and correlation, cherry picking, science-based studies. So basically it's saying you can't really trust what they're saying here. And it has, you wrote it in 2017. Gosh, you've been around a long time. Uh, you wrote it in 2017. It's just hit over 1 million page views. Wow. In fact, yeah, the last week it's been viewed a thousand times. I'm going to show you one really quick that you, you probably don't even remember you did this. Yeah, so, so let me put this in context for people listening, because I looked this up because I've done presentations uh, about the importance of the Girl Skeptics Project, is that you, people hear these numbers, oh, well, so if you sell a, you know, if you, if you write a book or, or you're going to get millions of people to read that, no, you're not. So if you look at, if you Google anything about the sales of, of nonfiction books, so anything about science and that kind of stuff, they don't sell very well. And the average, of course, the, you, know, you know, there's a bell curve, right? But the average you're going to get is to sell 3,500 copies of your book lifetime if you write a book about science or something. You know, that's, so yeah. So you can spend your time years to write a book or you can help us out to promote stuff that's already out there and get hundreds of thousands of people to read your article about it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. The, the page that you've written that has the most page views is the Havana Syndrome. But second to that is Deborah Feldman who is the author of the book um, unorthodox, which is really interesting. She's got, you've got just shy of 2 million page views. Wow. Yeah. That's impressive too. On I guess, person, I guess people, because Wikipedia is linked. So if someone watches a Netflix series, it says, you know, this is based on a book by Deborah Feldman. You click Deborah Feldman, you get to that page and then they'll read the page about her. That's true. Very, very fascinating. Okay. Here's one you, I'm sure you don't even remember. You wrote this one in 2016. And here, let me share it. Oh, yes. You know, that's been on my uh, list of things to do to actually improve it further for a long time, because the more I, I hear about this subject, uh, uh, but yeah. So how many views does this have? This has uh, 66,000. Wow. So Wikipedia is a powerhouse, but it isn't everything isn't a powerhouse. I mean, that was one of your first pages written in 2016. 
I'm looking to see if it was your first page. Uh, no, cancer, canine cancer detection. So weather panes. This isn't weather panes like you put on <laughs> no. a house. Window, window panes. Wind no. from coming no. in. This is people who say that they have, uh, they can predict the weather based right. on but Basically pressure changes, right. But I, I like the third line, third sentence in scientific investigation. You know, basically countering this claim, you know, people who go in an elevator in a tall building experience a, a much larger change in barometric pressure than than from a storm front coming in. And they don't complain about their arthritis hurting when they get off the elevator. So <laughs> that was, you know, that reminds me of spontaneous human combustion, which is a Wikipedia page we wrote. Does everything reminds you of spontaneous human combustion. Yeah, kind of. Well, well um, uh, one of the quotes <laughs> we have in the article was from Ben Bradford, who was talking about why don't we see people spontaneously combusting like in a football? You got you got eighty thousand people in the stadium. Why isn't one of those people just suddenly combusting? That's right, right. Giant group of people. I, no, it's only when they're alone at home smoking in front of a, fire, a fireplace, fireplace with when like a heavy coat on, and, and they're sleepy or something. Yeah, and they're yeah. That's the only time. Oh, here's here's another really good one that you did. This, I mean, look at the variety that our team has done. This is just hilarious. You know, we don't write always on one topic. Canine cancer detection. This is getting to be big again. So yeah, this oh, is another that one that I'd really 96, like. 96,000 page views. I'd really like to expand this because there's a lot of claims about, I don't like the name, but it, it's been changed a number of times and I don't think we could change it again. But, but it's like basically that dogs can smell cancer. That's what this is about. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, there are a lot of claims that dog can smell a lot of things, including recently COVID. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if we could change this and make it more general and canine cancer detection would be a subset of it. But yeah. Well, in cancer, there's so many different kinds of cancer. So that, I don't yeah, know. That, that do, do different kinds of cancers have different kinds of smells? I don't know. Yeah, I just do we really know? I mean, it's one of those feel good stories you want it to be real. Yeah, yeah, and there's a lot, a lot of anecdotal evidence. Like, you know, I was in a nursing home and a patient was dying of cancer, and the cat jumped up her in a lap and it stayed with her, and therefore the cat knew. You know, I've heard those stories even with cats. Yeah. Yeah, that's it, just one of it, it, a place that's flat where they yeah can... <laughs> yeah <laughs> so one of the things you can point out on this page is the uh the, the logo on the right the the box alternative oh, yes. medicine yeah the team puts those on pages so that people right away when they go to a page they say oh okay maybe this isn't legit like it's the first sign even before they read anything mm -hmm. that's so one that's, of the things where yeah. that you started doing a lot of too and then yeah. they started translating in the sidebar it's what it's called they translate it into, I think we have it in Spanish and Czech and some other languages, I believe. Yeah, yeah. And, and sc scroll down to see also, I want to see if there's something on this page about that. Uh, not, not too much. So so sometimes we try to put things in the see also too, that'll drive drive traffic to another page that might be talking appropriately about things. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, there's not too much on this page, but that, that happens a lot so that we can drive traffic from one page, which we've worked extensively on, to maybe another page, which we haven't worked extensively on, but it's re got really good information. So we might put that there also. Right. We need to get these things so that they're in the, sometimes you don't know what is going to be next. You have like, like with cupping, we did not know that was going to be a thing. So we yep. had no idea, uh, you know, uh, be prepared. So the better to be prepared for it now. I mean, we didn't know there'd be COVID, COVID, um, Right. Uh, dogs or anything like that that we would need to do something like that right but like but that. you but you have a lot of the team working on like important stuff including vaccines. america's frontline doctors and stuff like that that's pushing a lot back of vaccines on the anti-science movement that's going on now regarding vaccines yep no, that's great yeah and, and it's kind of funny uh, uh not funny but uh, not yeah, haha but, funny. Uh, uh yeah odd in timing a friend of mine told me her mother was anti-vax to the extent that she sent her an email that said, if anyone in the family at all gets a vaccine, they will never, ever be allowed to visit me again and see me in my house. Or I'm, I'm not going to be near them because the vaccine gives you COVID and it'll give anyone else COVID. And she said, where are you getting this information from? And she sent her the websites for America's Frontline Doctors, the agency we talked about before. So, yeah, I said, okay, send her the Wikipedia article for America's <laughs> Frontline Doctors. It's hilarious that we can do that. I, yeah. I know there's been several things that you've done where you've gotten in an argument with somebody about it on at work or something, and then the yeah, day, uh, you, know, uh, you rewrite page. the Wikipedia page and bring it. To, hey, have you seen this Wikipedia page on this? 
K KT tape was one. It was somebody who was a real advocate for it. Uh, this is kinesio tape that you wrap on your body. And again, you see this on athletes during seasons where there's a lot of skin to be seen. Or even actually, I saw in the in the Winter Olympics, uh, figure skaters were putting it on the outside of their leotards. So because like it's magic. And whenever that happens, people go, what's that? And they start Googling it and they it's hit like the copy. Wikipedia page. Right. And initially, the Wikipedia page was not that critical of it. It was like, oh, it's iffy. Maybe it works. Maybe it doesn't. And this guy at work was talking about it. And I went back to my desk and looked at it. Oh, no, I can't send on the Wikipedia page like this because it's just going to, you know, it's iffy. It's going to reinforce it. So I literally went home that night, got all the scientific criticism that was on the web about it, put it on the page. And then the next day, I said, you really need to look at the Wikipedia page. And so the next night he read it. He goes, wow, I can't believe I believe that. That is really <laughs> cool. <laughs> That's too funny. All right, Rob, I better sign off with you in okay. monopolizing your time. Thanks for having me. It's oh, it's been, been so great. Thank you so much for being a great, important part of GSOJW with your promos, the promotions and, and the audio promotions. And, and Rob came from Skeptic Zone. People, he's nowhere near Australia, but he was- Well, I got to say, uh, yeah, I, I you know, quickly, I found the whole skeptical movement was a thing on the uh, Skeptic's Guide to the Universe. And then I started uh, Googling other things and I found the Skeptic Zone and I heard interviews with Susan and I think uh, other members of the team on there. And yep, that's why I joined. And now so, he is yep. the well-known skeptic. Sort of, getting more well-known. Getting there, getting there. Everybody check <laughs> right. out the Delancey interview. I put it up on our our um, page and, and so on. Well, thanks, Rob. Right, thanks so check out my column on Skeptical Inquirer. Yeah. It's under the, the column name, the well-known skeptic. Thanks, Susan. <laughs> Bye, Rob.